My pleasure on behalf of the Lewis University History Department to welcome you to the James and Mary Claire Stepaniak Lecture. Um, first thing I would like to do is have an official welcome from um, uh, Lewis University's president, um, Dr. David Livingston. Thank you, Dr. Kremen. Uh, it is uh, a real pleasure to be here. I apologize, it's kind of an odd uh, mix of the table and the podium, but uh, we'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, it is uh, an exciting day. Uh, these lectures uh, every year bring history to life for us, and we are grateful to the Shapadiak family for uh, the gift that initially endowed uh, the lecture. We're grateful uh, for Fran being here today, so thank you for being here and representing the family. Uh, the, the theme today, as I was uh, thinking about this day, I was thinking about how, uh, what a powerful metaphor the home is in addition to being uh, a real place. And I uh, was thinking about how it represents belonging and a sense of uh, being welcomed and the place that we grow up, but also because yesterday was Halloween, I couldn't help but thinking of haunted houses and how it can turn that metaphor uh, of this belonging and wonderful place uh, into this uh, place that uh, invites us into that uh, darker, more scary side. Uh, I am very excited to be here with our panelists today. Uh, Kelly Klobuchar, uh, president of A Muse Consulting. Uh, Scott McCaffrey, uh, executive director of the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. And Donna Sack, vice president for community engagement and audience at the Neighbors Settlement. These three uh, people, along with our own uh, Dr. Dennis Kremen, um, who uh, heads up our uh, history center here at Lewis University and is a professor for our students, uh, I think are going to offer us an amazing uh, afternoon of ideas. I'm uh, really pleased that uh, Fran was able to join us today to uh, represent her family uh, in their gift to the, both the Lewis community but the broader uh, region in terms of being able to emphasize history and the power of history in our lives. Um, we are here today because of the generosity of James and Mary Claire Shapaniak. Jim and Mary Claire uh, were teachers in our community. Um, they embraced education. They had an appreciation for history. Uh, and that culminated in a philanthropy that uh, allowed their uh, life uh, goals to be lived out for a generation after generation, which is part of what we see here today. Uh, history is an important part of Lewis University. Uh, we were honored in the last uh, few months to be kind of the coordinator and uh, host for a couple weeks uh, of the Woodrow Wilson and the Great War traveling exhibit, which is leaving uh, the region in a few weeks to head to Princeton University. So we're very excited to have that uh, as a part of several different um, places in our region. Um, I also want to just make sure that I uh, mention, I'm sure Dennis will also mention this, but uh, though we don't have the exact date, we do have um, uh, the person who will be speaking at the spring uh, part of this series. Uh, so Dr. Jeffrey Wara from Northern Texas University uh, who specializes in modern military history will be speaking on his latest book Sons of Freedom, The Forgotten American Soldiers Who Defeated Germany in World War II. Uh, and he'll be here in the spring and we will look forward uh, to uh, his speech. Finally, I would like to uh, thank Dr. McMahon, who I thought I saw walk in here somewhere, but the uh, head of our uh, chair of our history department, um, uh, to Dr. Kremen, and to all of our history students uh, and faculty within uh, the broader university who are here to support our colleagues uh, and learn a little bit more about the history of the region. So uh, thank you all for being here. We're grateful to welcome you to Lewis University, and I will turn it over to Dr. Kremen. Thank you, Dr. Livingston. 
I just wanted to add a, a few more com comments. You know, um, here it is on All Saints Day. And really for the history department and for this community, you know, Jim Slapaniak um, and his um, wife Mary Claire, especially Jim, loved history. He loved getting out to events like this. Um, and it was such a pleasure to always see him. So I'm so pleased that we're able to carry on his memory and his work and, and love for this field. Um, uh, an event like this, though it looks really easy, um, you have to um, uh, depend on a whole bunch of people. And so I'm just gonna really quickly um, express my gratitude um, to the administration and Dave Livingston for being here today, um, marketing the events, um, uh, doing a great job. Um, Lisa is there in the back um, organizing for us. Um, University Advancement, such a great partner. Um, uh, marketing and communications. And then our um, colleagues already acknowledged in the history departments. Um, I'd also like to mention our uh, fine uh, partner, uh, Mona's here representing the Lockport Women's Club. And I think we're in the 10th year of the Lockport Women's Club Actor and Internship, which in the spring has a $2,000 um, internship that's been in the community, but also on campus. And it's really, um, can we just thank her on behalf of the Lockport Women's Club? Yeah. Um, we're in the midst of the Illinois Bicentennial. Um, uh, in uh, 1818, Illinois became a state. And, and the thought <coughs> behind this is, in the History of Illinois course, we bring our students to the history in our backyard. They go to Isle of Lacoche, they go to the Gaylord Building, they go down to the Joliet Ironworks site. We have a lot of sites that are right in our backyard. And this group here, this panel, has a lot to say about history in our own backyard and getting out and experiencing that. Um, and so I really just want to um, uh, thank them for being here um, uh, and also um, bring up that this area of historic house museums, um, we, we took as our point of departure this anarch anarchist guide to historic house museums, which really just argues that the field really needs to be turned upside down. Well, a lot of times when you think about historic houses, there's a big yawn. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping to gain insight into these sites. So the format will be um, each speaker will present um, some slides and um, um, do a presentation. Then we'll have a short time for a panel conversation at the end. Okay? And we'll start with Kelly, then go to Scott, and then go to Donna. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kelly Klobuchar, I'm president of Amuse Marketing and Consulting, and I work with a variety of clients in uh, historic sites, uh, small museums, and more often than not, little house museums. So, I'm here to tell you something that is probably going to be a bit controversial. Um, we need to stop doing what is expected of us in the house museum field. Um, for too many years, it's been a very, very long tour maybe an hour, maybe two, maybe three, depending on your dosage. Um, and it is time to start to give people what they want. Um, so why should we do the unexpected? Well, there are a couple of facts out there that are startling when you really look at them. First of all, there are more historic house museums in the United States than there are McDonald's restaurants. Let that sink in for a second. How many historic house museums have you been to this year? And how many times have you been to McDonald's this year? <laughs> okay, so that's a pretty major problem. Our audience is dying. And unfortunately, I mean that literally. The average age of uh, people who visit house museums is older. Uh, people in their 20s are, are less interested than people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Partially, this is because they don't have time. They don't have money to travel. Um, but we're not really replacing that audience um, year from year to year. We don't typically have a whole lot of local support in a house museum. Some do, but a lot of them are like, yeah, that's that old house up the hill, and some weird people lived there one time, or some historic people lived there one time, and yeah, I'll go see it someday, but think about how many times you've not seen things in your own backyard. And as somebody who, I write a blog called The Backyard Tourist, and for a majority of the time, my followers are coming up to me and saying, 
wow, I never knew that was there. And it's really literally in my backyard. It's two blocks from my house and I've never been. I didn't know it was open. So that's a problem we're seeing as well. Um, we have to change our public image. People think we're really dusty. <laughs> and they think they're going to be forced into a three-hour guided tour because it's happened to all of us at one time or another if you're a house fan. Um, we have to survive um, and remain, and actually in our case, we need to become more relevant to our communities. Um, and then there's the problem that if Lincoln didn't sleep in your house museum, what do you have in Illinois? Unless you were a famous architect uh, like you'll hear from uh, or later on, uh, you'll hear from Louis van der Rohe. There's also Frank Lloyd Wright. They did a couple little things here in the area that are pretty important. But if besides Lincoln and and those two other guys, it's it's pretty tough to get people to just come to visit your home. So at this point, we have nothing to lose. So it's time for us to take some chances. So there's some preconceived notions within <laughs> museums. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't think we're terribly exciting. Now, I'm sure that those of us in the room probably are, you know, I'm sure that you, just because you're here, attend things like lectures and concerts and, and art shows and cultural events and house museums and other kinds of museums. But unfortunately, we 60-some people are not the norm because there are a lot of people who are not here today. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing th people think about house museums <laughs> Um, they think we're dusty, they think we're creepy, they think we're weird, they think we're haunted. Um, the house I worked in for eight years, people were disappointed when I said it wasn't haunted. And I'm like, wow, that's a weird reaction because you're actually hoping somebody is stuck here for all of eternity <laughs> in this house that you've only visited one time. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, thing for people. So what we have to do is figure out how we are going to rebuild our audience. And in order to do that, we have to take a, several pages out of uh, Frank Mignoni uh, and something, I can't think of his last name, but the, the um, Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums. And I've worked with Frank. Frank actually visited a site that I was working with and you know, we had a ball. We had a slumber party. We slept overnight in a historic mansion that no one had slept in since the last living person lived there. And we, it, was, it was cool, it was very, very cool. So in order to rebuild an audience, you have to make a house a place for living again. So often, you can't sit on that chair, you can't touch that thing, all of these things are behind ropes. You have to make it a place for living, and you have to entertain people. That, entertaining people, and teaching them, of course, but you can sneak education into entertainment pretty easily. Um, that is the best and highest use for a house. Wouldn't you agree, living in it? Um, and so we have to make it, again, a place for living. So this is a picture of a little party I threw that um, we did every Friday night, and it was starting to draw three to 500 people every week to my site. Put a band on the lawn. No, it was not Mozart, even though it was an 1874 built house. Um, it, was, it was a Beatles cover band. It was a Jimmy Buffett band. It was country. It was jazz. It was all sorts of different things that have broad appeal today. So we breathe life back into the house that you can see in the background there. The other thing that is extremely important for all of us, and I'm sure that each of these things are going to be touched on by my colleagues, um, so I'm just kind of giving you an overview, but your words and your advocacy. And all of us here in this room, as fans of history, can advocate for house museums and museums in general. Uh, but you have to use strong words. You have to say, this place matters, and it matters to me, and here's why. And you have to preserve this place for the future generations. Um, and you need powerful imagery. Um, those are my nephews. I will rent them to you if you need them for your historic house. Um, the big one really likes to go, actually the two biggest ones uh, like to go to historic homes and you'll see, I think, another slide of them later on. But um, this was a very powerful image and it went all over the place. I don't want to call it viral, 
um, but it was it was big. It was a big deal. Um, so use powerful words and imagery to advocate for your site and tell your story. Um, the other thing that we never let people do, how many of you have been to a historic house and they say, no pictures? Can't use a flash, can't you? I mean, obviously flash, yes, that would be problematic if you have a million visitors a year. And if they're all using flash, yes, that might bother your text ads and your wallpaper and things like that. But aside from, you know, the Biltmore, um, who has a million visitors a year? You know, I mean, the Frank Lloyd Wright House even, and, and Farnsworth, I mean, they, we're, we're not approaching that. Um, so at the last site where I worked full time, we created a photo pass. And of course, I've done this everywhere I've um, consulted as well. Um, in this case, we were charging people $5 to buy a photo pass, and then they were putting pictures on Facebook and doing my marketing for me. <laughs> it was wonderful. So we've got to come from a place of yes, we can't have all of these rules. Having the you know guides up so you can't walk <coughs> into a room fully and then say, no, you can't take pictures. It's too many no's, and no one likes to hear no. So how to shorten a three-hour tour? These two guys are the two biggest little people in the slide a couple um, slides back. That's Owen and um, Jackson. And I had a problem at a site where I had tours that literally, I had two guides that were three hour tour people. I'm not joking around, I'm not exaggerating. Um, and the average tour was about an hour and a half. And our average attention spans are about 38 minutes. And then we all start to check out. And that's actually getting shorter and shorter and shorter because of social media and everything else. So I had an idea, because I was trying to reach some, some family audiences, to train these two little monkeys on um, giving tours. And actually what I had them do is train me. I had them take me through the house, and they told me what was interesting and what they wanted to know more about in each room. And I answered the question. So we marketed it as a family tour, and it was a discounted rate for whole families, but we didn't know if it was gonna work or not. And these guys managed to get families, groups of 20 to 30, <coughs> through this house that my docents were taking an hour and a half to get through in 22 minutes. So I started having docents, instead of me, follow them on the tour and say, you are not to speak unless the children are asked a question that you that they don't know the answer to. But I had trained them to just say, you know, I don't know, but we'll find out at the end. And most people would either ask me at the end or something or something else. We got the tours done to 22 minutes, and those docents were shaking in their boots because they knew that three hours was no longer going to be an acceptable number. So um, use children whenever you can. And again, these two are up for rent. Um, they're at <laughs> a little higher rate because they're really smart and they can shorten your chores. <laughs> so, the other thing, we talked about All Saints Day today, uh, Halloween yesterday. Can we talk about ghosts and historic houses? They're, they're, we're divided on this. Some people say no because it's history and it's disrespectful. And I tend to agree, depending on the house. Um, but what you can do is program in different ways um, and talk about other things that are spooky but aren't ghosts. And so we talked about Victorian funeral customs and we talked about, um, we actually had a paranormal team come in but they didn't investigate our house. They did the five minute reveal, which is the best part of every Ghost Hunter show on television at the end when they show you what they saw on Earth. And they did a reveal for every place they went that year. And they became one of our biggest fundraisers because every year they had new stuff. And we still weren't haunted. So it worked out really well. <laughs> um, the other thing I advise is use the land that you have. Um, the site where I worked for eight years, we went from having 20 events a year in 2009. I started in August of 2010. And when I left this February, I had between 100 and 120 events scheduled from now through the end of 2020. So we really built the program. A lot of it was outside. That's no wear and tear on the house. So we had yoga, we had classes, we had children's songs. Um, this was a storytelling event where everyone had to tell their stories by singing songs. So it was 
one guy sang the record the Edmund Fitzgerald. I don't really recommend that one because it's long and a little sad. Um, but otherwise, <laughs> it was a it was a pretty fun event, and <laughs> I like my, my history friends are laughing at me. But otherwise, um, it was really fun. And most people who attend an outdoor event will eventually say, "Hey, is that place ever open? Can I go inside?" And yes, 360 days a year you can. So um, that worked out very well for us. And then the other thing is right sizing. Look at big events that you attend all the time and figure out what elements of that you can use and right size for your venue. I love to go to Ravinia, and I was 110 miles away from Ravinia and thought, I have all this space. So this was our first Ravinia style concert. Um, that one only had about 50 people, but again, by the end of it, we were having between you know, two, three, four hundred, five hundred people, depending on who we had. So it was really nice and it was a good fundraiser for us. And it was five dollars a person. So the community loved it because it was inexpensive. And a lot of them can't afford to do Ravinia once a year, but they can afford to come here every Friday. So and they were allowed to BYOB and bring whatever picnic food they wanted. So some people would cater an entire table, others would bring subway. It would just depend on what they were able to do. And then we also right-sized um, MTVs unplugged which was an acoustic. Um, this was the first one. We used microphones. We didn't use them after the first concert because we didn't need it. The house was built to have music in it. And it's a small group of probably 20 to 30 people who can see this, so it's very exclusive. And this event as well was selling out. I had season passes, and you couldn't get in on a Friday night for this. So it was, it was fun. So there's some lessons learned from doing the unexpected. First of all, it takes a long time to change people's perceptions. We still have people who yawn and say, ah, oh, house museums. But if we continue to work on it, um, you know, they'll, they'll come around. We still do like to dress up like Victorians every now and then. Um, but we don't have to turn butter on the back porch every weekend. Um, I think that's something that might be a... <laughs> okay, you've done it. That's why you're laughing. <laughs> Um, your, your board will eventually come around to all of your crazy ideas. Uh, as long as you break even on the majority of them, you won't get in too much trouble. I found that personally. Um, I was definitely one who did not ask for permission. I just did stuff. And when I got in trouble later on, I said, yeah, but look, how much money I made. And they were pretty, pretty excited. So this is what people thought when I came on board. This is where we were. And really, there were images that looked very much like this of the house that I worked in. It was an old Victorian style house with a mansard recline, and everyone said Adams Family, Munsters, or what, or you know some other psycho, unfortunately, uh, any of those things. And then I polluted the internet with images like this, of us doing fun things, of us living in the house, of us, us living on the grounds, and of us doing fun things. And the community um, has definitely responded and has definitely changed and um, is attending things. So um, this is me. If any of you need to speak to me again, I'll be here afterwards. Um, but that is my company, Amuse Consulting. And I thank you very much for having me. All right. So how many of you, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have been to the Barnesworth House before? OK, that's not unusual. So it looks like about maybe uh, 15% of the room. <laughs> so it's located just uh, west of Yorkville. There's a Plano mailing address. And uh, here is the Rock River. I'm sorry, the Fox River. And um, this is River Road. Plano would be up here. Yorkville's over here. The house is located right here. This sort of uh, wooded clearing. Clearing the woods here. And then there's another wooded parcel, somewhat wooded parcel here, and then a field. So it's a 60 acre site. But it was once part of a 12,000 acre farm owned by Colonel Robert McCormick, uh, uh, who owned and uh, was editor of the Chicago Tribune. So throughout the uh, Depression, Colonel McCormick, well, he not him personally, but his staff would write pieces for the Chicago Tribune to help farmers during the Depression increase their yields. Uh, he was doing a lot of things that we think uh, are very commonplace in agriculture today. It was sort of pre-chemicals. Uh, um, heavy chemical use, of course, started around World War II or just after in this country. 
So he was advocating things like planting hedgerows to attract the birds to control insects. He was doing erosion control experiments, crop rotation experiments. So there are a lot of interesting um, articles about his scientific farm uh, farming practices at the Yorkville Farms that are found in the Chicago Tribune archives. And here is the piece, uh, right here, this little uh, uh, offshoot here, where Farnsworth House was built. And this was the shops. This is where the two roads through the farms came together. So the harness shop, the carpentry shop, and then there was a big vegetable garden here in the lower uh, area. And uh, by the 1940s, he was running cattle through the property. The sort of scientific farming era was sort of uh, 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 not of interest anymore. And um, so Edith, uh, Farnsworth was able to acquire the first 10 acres and then later acquired a 20 acre parcel and a 30 acre parcel. Um, here's what uh, this uh, area looked like um, in the uh, 19th century. Plano was considered a beauty spot if you go back and look at old publications. And indeed, there were a lot of gentlemen farmers in Plano. We oftentimes uh, read a lot about uh, gentlemen farmers, you know, in other uh, more populated areas in Illinois. And Plano was always small, but there was a good deal of agricultural wealth there in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Here's a photograph of the uh, Trust Bridge, the Iron Trust Bridge, which stood right here. And if you know the design of Farnsworth House, these big rectangular openings of glass with a steel frame, there's an obvious source of inspiration in this bridge. So the house was uh, sited here, looking right at the bridge, and the bridge was sort of angled with this long side toward the house. Um, and so a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so here's a photograph of the house under construction. Edith Farnsworth bought the property in 1945, and she uh, first hired Keck and Keck, and they are modernist architects that more and more is being uh, known about in Chicago. They designed uh, some houses in Aurora, for example. Um, and uh, there's only one book about Keck and Keck, unfortunately, that I'm sure there'll be more in the future because we're finding out that they were really leading architects, post-war architects in the Chicago area. And a lot of the houses, although renovated, still remain. Unfortunately, and rather ironically, um, she ended up working with an architect. She fired Keck and Keck because they said, well, if we design a house for you, you'll like it. And she said, no, I don't think so. I want to be more involved in the design process. And then ultimately, of course, she hires Mies van der Rohe, who kind of ran steamroller over her. <laughs> In the end, she was not very happy with the house she got. But a little known fact about uh, Farnsworth House is that it was the, the, it's much celebrated for its proportions and its modularity. But in reality, it was a very uh, pragmatic response to some existing trees. Here's this old vegetable garden area. It was a flat meadow at the time that he first visited the site. And he wanted to nestle the house between the trees as close to the river as possible. Of course, they knew that the river flooded. So the first finished floor level was set five foot six inches above the um, existing grade. Um, as it turned out, and many of you well know, that wasn't enough. <laughs> he bumped it up a foot higher than the highest known flood in his recorded history. But what they didn't take into account is all the development and pervious surfaces that would be added to the uh, upstream, to the Fox River. So uh, the house has flooded uh, 13 times, I believe, since uh, its completion in 1951, the worst of which was in 96, 97. Um, so here's what the house looked like right after its completion. It almost looks like a Lakeshore Drive apartment just dropped by helicopter into the woods. And that was very intentional. It's a very sleek, urbane, modern uh, contrast to this rustic setting. And because of that contrast, that heightened contrast, it started generating a lot of publicity early on. In 1947, a model was shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and architects from around New York got really excited about this. They'd never seen anything like this. And um, so even before the house was built, it was starting to be published in architectural histories and design histories. So we have a lot of visitors who are in their 80s today, and this was on their bucket list. They're coming from around the world. Over a third of our visitors are from outside the United States, a third are from the Midwest, and a third from other parts of the United States. And it's not unusual for an elderly person to come with their granddaughter or grandson and say, you know, I studied this in a college back in the 50s. So it's really been an important um, house ever since its construction. It's considered among the uh, top five 
modern um, works of architecture in the world. So it's in a uh, number, and, it, and it's in Plano, Illinois. So <laughs> go figure. Um, the landscape, though, was not to the liking of the um, second owner, Peter Palumbo. Here's Edith Farnsworth. She was a, a very impressive uh, woman. She, I call her a forerunner of second wave feminism. She was a feminist in the 40s. So she was really well ahead of her time. Never married. She was an intellect. She studied classics at University of Chicago starting at age 13. Started living in Italy when she was age 17. Started translating Italian poetry and dating an Italian poet in her early 20s. And uh, is said to have had a rumor with Miss van der Rohe. And uh, that was probably the source of a lawsuit that uh, continued uh, between the two of them. But that's another story. Anyway, she liked the, having this modern uh, uh, home in a very rural setting. So here is her uh, finished interior. It's a combination of uh, uh, modern furniture, Scandinavia and the United States. She was a world traveler, displayed her art in the house, much to Mies van der Rohe's chagrin. He didn't want things hung on the walls. Um, here are some just uh, early color sh uh, slides from the uh, 50s and the early 60s when she was living in the house. Rather happily at this point, she had a very large screen porch up to the house, so she'd come out from Chicago on Friday night, and then later in her career she was there on Wednesday evenings as well, but she'd spend the weekend. She'd throw open the doors, she'd crank up the stereo, um, and uh, she would also play her violin. She'd have uh, guests in for dinner, have slumber parties. I can show you, it was very informal, kind of bohemian. By the late 60s, this is what it looked like. But if you know the history of interior design, this was very high style to take antiques and put them in a modern interior. Um, so she wasn't alone in this sort of look. Um, and of course, the second owner was Lord Peter Palumbo. Some of you might know about him. Um, and he returned the house to the Miesian aesthetic. Mies van der Rohe's furniture, uh, a very stark modernist design. And that's how it's presented today. Uh, this is the Barcelona Pavilion. Some of you might know this if you studied architectural history. Um, Mies was already a well-known architect by 1928, but this really catapulted him onto the international scene. And because of this building and a few others at the time period, the international style of architecture uh, evolved. Here's his Villa Turk uh, Tugendhat in Czechoslovakia from 1928-1930. You'll see a lot of similarities to um, the Farnsworth House in that uh, house. And then finally to the Farnsworth House, which was started in 1945 but completed in 1950-51. Uh, we have a visitor center at Farnsworth House, so those of you who haven't been there before, uh, we have an orientation film, a gift shop, an outdoor cafe, and then we have a separate uh, Farnsworth gallery, and we have uh, three to five shows a year. This is the wardrobe, which was essentially a room divider from the house, um, and uh, we put it here because it's a half a million dollars to restore it, rebuild it uh, by today's dollars, so we keep it out of the house as the house continues to flood, unfortunately. Um, all right, so here's the house in winter. I hope all of you will uh, visit us. Um, it's beautiful in winter. We're open on Tuesdays and Saturdays this winter, and we're having a series of um, holiday house parties. So the first two weeks in December, you can come with your friends and tour the house decorated in 1950s style. And then we're having three cocktail parties on November 30th, December 1st, and uh, December 2nd. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but. Certainly, as Callie was showing, uh, the idea of an old stale house museum is one that we want to avoid. We have a very active um, uh, schedule of programs and events at Farnsworth House, and um, trying hard to, compete, uh, to appeal to a broad range of visitors. I love museums. I think that they can inspire people. And I also think that they're a place for community. Um, and that's really what we're talking about here, I think, today, is about community and all different kinds of communities and how people are engaged and how they're not engaged. Um, let me tell you a little story about Napier Settlement. And I think that you'll see that we are a site in transformation. Um, this is the Martin Mitchell Mansion. Uh, not a mansion in ter Newport terms, but certainly a mansion in Midwestern terms. When the last descendant of the family passed away in the 1930s, she left her home, this home, and its carriage house to the city of Naperville, along with 12 immediate adjacent acres, 
to be used in honor of her pioneering family. She had some stipulations. There was a perpetual trust. Uh, the museum would always uh, be a museum. And it was to be a place for gathering the community. The other piece of her puzzle is that the surrounding 212 acres of land was also part of that trust, and it was gifted to the city of Naperville and to be used for the public good, whatever that was deemed over the years. So now on that land, there's everything from park district land, a hospital, a cemetery, a skeet shooting area. If you know downtown Naperville, this land is prime real estate in these days. And I think Naperville really would have been a very, very different place if these acreage hadn't been gifted to the city to be used in the way that it, that it currently is. So, back to the 1930s, the house is really a very eclectic uh, historic house museum. There's everything in it from guns to dolls to whatever the 1940s widget was of, of the day. But it was really overseen by the couple different entities, the Park District, and the 1960s come about. And in the 1960s, it was the lead up to something that drove museum mania in this country, especially history museum mania. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Bicentennial? Ah, the Bicentennial. America's Bicentennial. So that's going to happen in the 1970s. And what else was happening in the 1960s that may have drawn history and heritage mania across the country? There's something else going on. Urban renewal. Urban renewal. There's something else going on. A little something called the Civil Rights Movement. There were all kinds of civil rights movement going on in the 1960s. What would people want to do when faced with societal change? They want to protect their legacy and their heritage. So, in Naperville, there was a church threatened, an Episcopal church. Um, grassroots effort came about, they saved the church, and where was space to locate the church? I'm going to go forward a few slides. The space to locate the church was on that 12 acres where the Martin Mitchell Mansion is. So the grassroots effort comes about, actually the Naperville Heritage Society, which administers the now museum, will be 50 years um, next year. So they find a location, and ultimately, there are 30 structures relocated to this property. Now I'll go backward. Uh, in the 1990s, an effort was made to uh, build, construct a new visitor center. There had been so much traffic um, through, the, through the site that there really needed to be a place to have a core history exhibit about Naperville, not just through the historic houses. And as well, there needed a place of welcome. So the determination was made to recreate a building um, that was originally in downtown Naperville, had been torn down in the 1940s, but um, thank you to the uh, Historic American Building Survey during the Depression, there were floor plans and elevations. This allowed the site to really start thinking about itself in very different terms. So what you see now is the layout of the site, and it is a bunch of historic houses. So I not only have to deal with one historic house that has interpreters in it that want to talk for one to three hours, thank you very much, Kelly. I have 30 historic buildings that people want to talk about for one to three hours. Not only that, we had a historic restoration um, of the mansion 
which is the Caroline Martin Mitchell legacy. It was a $3 million restoration, and it was done in a very, um, in a very traditional way. Uh, this uh, opened, reopened, I should say, in the, um, about 10, 15 years ago, and has had a lot of traffic. But, we're not telling stories we should be telling. Remember that preemption house was built so that we could put in there a core history about <coughs> Naperville. The core history exhibit is actually wrapped around 42 local uh, paintings, folk art paintings by um, a, a gentleman who actually was a sign painter for, um, for a very large furniture company that used to be in Naperville. So we're telling the narrative of Naperville's history through the eyes of a gentleman who was painting in the 1950s to about the 1980s. Now, what do you think his view of Native American history was? Think about popular culture. What's coming in? Westerns, John Wayne movies. You know, there's, there's, this is kind of the world view. So we know that we really need to work with this. <coughs> we need to decolonize this exhibit, tell part of this history, a substantial part of the history, um, through the eyes of people who had lived experience. It was the Potawatomi that were on uh, the lands that Naperville now reside on. And they had an incredibly thriving community. When Naperville's came in in the 1830s, they probably knew full well that they were going to be able to preempt land because we would have the Indian Removal Acts um, shortly, there, shortly thereafter. But we don't tell that part of the story. We only say, you were able to preempt land at $1.25 an acre. But whose land was preempted? What was that story? What was that narrative? So we're currently looking back and saying, how do we need to tell this story? So we are currently undergoing a capital campaign. I use the word undergoing literally for anyone who's run a, a capital campaign. Um, and we're looking to how can we change and tell our narratives of contemporary Naperville through a historic village that really was designed to tell a story that went from 1831 to 1907. First, we had to change our mission. We had to say, we're going to be sharing Naperville's history through today. To make this relevant today, we have to tell the entire narrative. So through that, we are going to be building an agricultural interpretive center, a large scale exhibit space, and we're going to be adding a new visitor center that will be able to allow digital experiences, which we really can't offer within our current construction. There's also some other amazing things about Naperville. I would argue that Naperville's 20th century history is far more significant than its 19th century history. And who would think of Naperville as a place where we should be telling our nation's Asian American story. Would anyone ever think about Naperville in that way? Thank you. 20% <laughs> of Naperville's <laughs> residents are Asian. They are not reflected at all in that pioneer narrative. By switching the mission up and going to present day, we have the opportunity to tell the story of all Napervillians. And we're doing that. We have sought funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Institute of Museum and Library Services, and we now have seven federal grants to help us make this significant shift. So the first thing we did was we brought in an artist who does, um, works around Asian identity, and he is Chinese American, Wing Young Huey. I met him at a conference a few years back, and he was talking about his art for about two minutes, and I thought, oh boy, <laughs> you need to come to Naperville. 
and, he, and we got the money to be able to allow that. We've had this exhibit up uh, starting in May. It's been extended two times. And we have had uh, pop-up evenings where we've had um, community conversations. We've had um, author talks, art talks. And we talked to the people who need to be in full community um, conversation with everyone in the Naperville community and to all of our visitors. We have now have the first artifacts from our Chinese American and Indian American communities. We have a wedding sari that was gifted to us as the very first Indian American artifact. And we have a rice cooker. Um, that was gifted to us by a Chinese American resident. And all of a sudden, the conversations about who we are and what we are are changing. And I have to look at our historic structures and say, we have a law office on our site, an 1840s law office. The building was moved over to our site in the 1980s. And in the 19, until that point in time, was located in downtown Naperville. It never had running water. Never had any more plum plumbing. And we have an opportunity to take that building, for example, and say, how can we talk about changing communities? How can we talk about public policy? How can we talk about debates over outhouses in downtown areas? Um, those are all opportunities that are right before us. We have a 19th century doctor's office on our site. It's a great building. It's currently being used by a group of ladies. Yes, they call themselves the weed of the ladies. We can't keep a sign on our fence um, advertising their floral arrangement sales. That is currently their workroom. Would that not be a better place to have partnerships to talk about um, the opiate issue that we have in Naperville and kids dying because they're addicted, is that a better way to utilize that building? So how do you talk about this with people that need to be able to see how the site can shift and be something very, very different and tell many, many stories? And Ruby on Huey that I mentioned is a photographer who, um, who we had come to Naperville. His, one of his most significant projects is a six mile long project in downtown St. Paul and Minneapolis where he told the stories of the various neighborhoods that he was um, actually lived in. And he works in huge, large scale photography art. And we really felt that to do justice to him, and to help people understand where we're going with the village, we needed to put his art out onto the historic site. And so on the fort, which represents Fort Payne, which was built as part of the uh, Black Hawk Uprising, as it's called, um, we hung Wayne's work. And we have had phenomenal response to this. The center photo is um, of the Chen family and Nancy Chen opened up her house in the 1970s and had Chinese New Year in her house. And within a decade, those Chinese New Years were dispersed into many, many, many houses across Naperville because she couldn't hold everybody in her home. Her daughter went away to school and has returned, um, now lives in Naperville a couple blocks from her mom, and her daughter Hannah, who is now second generation Napervillian, is, um, goes to school where her mom went to school. But this is a story through which we can tell the story of why is there a large Asian population in Naperville? It's because there was a change in immigration law in the 1960s. It's because I-88, the high-tech quarter, was deliberately sought after in Naperville. You have Argonne to the, to the uh, south, you have Fermi Lab to the north, you need highly qualified workers. 
all of a sudden the dynamic in the communities is changing. And we, be, we need to be able to tell that narrative in a village that was founded to be an 18, basically an 1800s village. So it's a great challenge. We're having our Neighbor Nights um, series, which Kelly talked about, her concert series. And I was talking to the event planner and said, do you know next year on our, I think it, it's our July Neighbor Nights and on our August Neighbor Nights, they fall exactly on the anniversary of Woodstock <laughs> and the moonwalk. We can talk about 1960s Naperville in a way that um, is going to be told through music and through fun and through great community conversations. And I think some of the best outcomes from the exhibit that's in this slide are, two, are twofold. One, I had one of the participants say to me, I felt invisible in Naperville until I participated in this project. Invisible. He had lived in Naperville since the 1970s. That's pretty powerful work that museums can do. Nancy Chen, who was photographed in the middle, said, Joe Naper? Nobody ever made a connection for me before. Joe Naper was not my connection to community history. And now you're helping me to grapple with what all of those connections are. So I think all of our buildings, whether it's, whether it's Farnsworth House or whether it's a small historic house museum, we all need to think very, very differently. The cover of History News this month um, is a property, a National Trust property, actually, that was um, a historic house for quite a number of years. And the decision was made, you know, maybe the best thing for that house should be that it should be a house. And now there's a family living in that house. So I think that as we have these more historic houses than McDonald's, um, we need to be really open to all the possibilities and to think of these as places of community. And I think that um, Dr. Livingston started out by saying that the power of history and the power of place is so important. And it is. It's, it's elemental to who we are where we come from, where we live, how we think about things. Um, and museums can be places of dialogue. And I can't think of any more important uh, role to play uh, right now than being able to do that. So thank you. to again thank Kelly, Scott, and Donna for their, their wonderful presentations. I think it gives you an insight to this dynamic field of historic houses and what's going on. Um, what I'd like to uh, do now is invite our off-campus guests. We have a um, small reception here, um, um, small luncheon. So if our um, guests could go first and then we would have our students go next. Um, you can um, help yourself up, uh, uh, help yourself to lunch. Um, we would start from the right and go towards the left. And again, um, uh, uh, Kelly and Scott and Donna, uh, thank you so much, and they'll be available for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.